So this afternoon, we are joined by Senator James Cowan, who's the chair of Dying with Dignity Canada's Board of Directors. We have Helen Long, Dying with Dignity CEO, who joined us in March of this year. And we have Cindy Lutra, who is here as our uh, Director of Government and Stakeholder Relations and joined us in the summertime. So thank you to all three of you for being here this afternoon. What we're going to do just to get us started is a bit of a poll. And this is to understand um, what your knowledge is of C7. So that is the proposed uh, legislation that is scheduled to come into effect later this year. So this is our first poll. Uh, like I said, it's going to pop up on your screen. So just hold tight for one second and you should see that up on your screen now. So there are four options to choose from. I see some of you are, are clicking away, that's perfect. Um, and we'll give you about 20 seconds or so to, to complete the poll um, and then share the results. So this is just a great exercise to see where we're at today. And hopefully uh, by the end of the session, we all have learned more about C7 and, and the other pieces of assisted dying uh, legislation that are that's, uh, on the table right now. Okay, so a lot of you have voted. This is great. Um, pretty much all of you have done it. That's, that's fantastic. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results with everybody. So a little bit knowledgeable. 38% uh, of you are uh, at a little bit knowledgeable, 36% somewhat knowledgeable, uh, six very knowledgeable, and 20% not knowledgeable at all. So as said, um, hopefully we can change that and learn a bit more about C7 this afternoon. Alrighty. So I am going to turn it over now to Helen Long, our CEO, to get started. Um, Helen, do you want to take it from here with some background information? Great. Thanks, Kelsey. And welcome, everyone. So I'm going to start off by just doing a really uh, brief overview of the MAID legislation and speaking specifically to the legislation. So I want to acknowledge we won't be talking about all of the uh, cases and the individuals that uh, have been involved along the way. So I want to really recognize Sue Rodriguez, Julia Lamb, uh, Gloria Taylor and Kay Carter, Audrey Parker, and most recently Jean Truchon and Nicole Glado. Without their courage, their experience, the, the work and the effort that they did, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So we started in February of 2015 uh, with the unanimous Carter decision, which struck down the federal pro prohibition on physician-assisted uh, dying ruling that it violated the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and that it was in fact unconstitutional. So in um, May of 2016, Bill C-14 was passed and in June 17th, the federal legislation on medical assistance in dying was enacted, uh, putting us into the position that we are, are currently living under. Um, following that, uh, Jean Chuchon and Nicole Gladeau presented a constitutional challenge to the reasonably foreseeable death requirement at the Quebec Superior Court. And on September 11th of 2019, Justice Christine Bourdoin struck down the reasonably foreseeable rule in, in both Bill C-14 and also a clause in Quebec's Bill 52 uh, referring to end of life. Uh, she noted that they infringe both Section 7 of the Charter, which is the right to life, liberty, and security, and Section 15, which is the right to equal treatment under the law. So in February, of February 24th of 2020, uh, Bill C-7 was put forward by the government. On March the 2nd, they received their first extension of that deadline, and then on June 25th, the second extension as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure as many of you know, the government probed on August 18th and we just got back to business with the throne speech last, last week. So the current status, um, we're going to talk about in a minute, but at this point in time, the deadline of December 18th, 2020 is still sitting um, as a result or as refers back to uh, the Trushan decision. Uh, Puneet, you want to get into the details of Bill C-7 for us? Sure. Be happy to. Um, so, uh, Bill C-7, uh, there are some, uh, some major proposed changes that have been made in it. Um, 
obviously the uh, the first one is uh, the removal uh, of the provision uh, uh, that um, a person's natural death be uh, reasonably uh, foreseeable to be eligible for made. Obviously, that's a, a major change um, and a major amendment that's being proposed because it broadens access to MAID, which is something that is obviously important to all of us here. Um, number two, Audrey's amendment, uh, obviously referring to uh, Audrey Parker, and, and uh, we're talking about the proposal uh, that would allow for a waiver of the requirement for uh, final consent uh, for and this is for patients who's, um, who have been assessed and approved, uh, a date has been set uh, for their main provision, uh, but uh, because of their condition, they may lose uh, capacity to, uh, to consent. And so that's a, uh, a, an amendment that we are uh, obviously uh, very much in support of. Uh, there are other proposed changes. Uh, these would apply uh, in, in all cases, uh, but the first one would be uh, an independent witness can be a paid personal uh, or uh, healthcare worker, um, and one independent witness uh, would be required for written requests for made. Uh, this second point uh, obviously has been uh, uh, is seen as an eased safeguard because it has uh, the requirement uh, is been uh, being proposed uh, to be reduced from two to one. Um, but we also believe that you know the requirement for two uh, independent witnesses could have actually served to be a barrier. So uh, obviously we are in support of this uh, for these uh, particular proposed changes in Bill C seven. Um, there are, again, other changes, and you'll see that they fall under um, uh, various uh, headings. Uh, this one would be when natural death is uh, reasonably foreseeable. Uh, the 10-day reflection uh, period has been removed or is being proposed uh, to be removed. Um, when natural death uh, is not reasonably foreseeable, there are also some, uh, some interesting uh, proposals within uh, C7, including uh, one, assessor, uh, one assessor must have experience uh, in the condition uh, causing that suffering. And really, you know, our position on that is that uh, this requirement itself also uh, may be a barrier in access. You know, you might think, of, uh, of people in uh, remote or rural communities uh, and uh, hard to reach areas. So that could be a barrier to uh, accessing MAID, which is something of concern to us. Um, so we simply call upon the government to, to change this requirement. And I'm gonna read what we're proposing. Uh, so that documentation uh, of appropriate consultation with a healthcare provider who does have expertise uh, will be accepted. Uh, that is something that we feel strongly about and uh, wording that we are uh, suggesting uh, be used. Um, and the other point that we make about this is that our own Clinicians Advisory Council um, has indicated to us that this is already happening, so um, there is already some sort of pre-validation, I would say. Um, the other one, 90 days between the first assessment and the first uh, May date, it can be shortened, but generally, you know, 90 days is a long time. 90 days is a time that would, we think is too long and just simply extends uh, suffering. Uh, what we are proposing uh, to uh, the federal government uh, is a period of 30 days. We think that that's reasonable, uh, and we think it uh, uh, it would it, it it's something that would be much much more preferred than um, than three times longer than that. Uh, now the parliamentary review um, of uh, there's a few areas uh, that we are going to. Uh, be addressing within the parliamentary review. I'm just hoping uh, my slide is maybe locked here. Oh, okay. So, um, 
as most folks know, the uh, the parliamentary review is going to address uh, three issues that were not addressed um, in uh, Bill C-7. In fact, the first one here, mental illness, uh, as the sole underlying condition was specifically excluded and explicitly excluded uh, in, in Bill C-7. So, um, mental illness as the sole underlying request, I think most people know uh, that our position is that um, we are opposed um, uh, to that uh, form of uh, discrimination who's uh, against the people whose suffering we believe is, is no less real than uh, anyone who's uh, experiencing some sort of uh, uh, physical suffering. And so uh, we think, in fact, that uh, it could be found to be unconstitutional if challenged as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, we we want the, um, sorry, the, the second point, advanced requests were made. Uh, we, uh, our position is that uh, the government should simply lift the ban uh, on advanced requests. It, it discriminates against people with uh, conditions that could be capacity eroding, such as uh, dementia. I know that there's been a lot of discussion around that. So uh, we call, we have been, and we call on the, the federal government to lift that ban on advanced requests. Um, now, the third area concerning mature minors, well, I think most uh, of us know that there are, uh, you know, in many jurisdictions across Canada, uh, the, you know, mature minors already have the right to make some, some major life decisions, including um, the right to consent to or to refuse uh, life-saving medical treatment. And so, you know, we do understand that this is uh, a sensitive issue for many uh, when we're talking about minors and, and made. It is a, a tough uh, topic, but uh, we do make sure that we, uh, our position also includes um, uh, our feeling that, um, you know, there could be a need for additional safeguards uh, when it comes to allowing mature minors to access MAID. Um, and I think we're going to go through some questions now, right? Good. Before, just if I could just interject, Kelsey, just on this, the under C-14, which was the original medical assistance in dying uh, legislation, which was passed uh, some years ago, uh, there were three items that were, re were referred uh, to government for further study, the three items that Benita has just mentioned. And the government commissioned the Canadian Council of the Academies to undertake studies on those three areas. And they've produced three very useful reports, which are on the website of the Canadian Council of the Academies. And all of the information that you'd like to have, considerations you'd like to, to uh, think about on, on those topics are contained in those reports. So I commend those reports to anybody who's interested in background and more information about any of those topics. Okay. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Kanit, for the background information. Um, so, as the slide says, we do have a, a few questions, but before getting into that, I just want to reiterate, um, we can't see or hear any of the attendees. That's because we have uh, close to 800 people on the call today. Um, so everybody is muted, and if you do have questions, you can share those in the Q&A section. Um, and we're also recording, so you can access this on the Dying with Dignity Canada website um, next week when we post it. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into the questions then. So now that we've established a bit of background, um, the parliamentary review is going to look at advanced requests, but Bill C-7 is proposing that a person might not necessarily need to give final consent in some cases. Can you please speak to the differences between these two ideas? Helen, can you uh, take the lead on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, yeah, so the advanced requests are quite clearly right now not available. There's no, um, there's no allowance within the current law uh, put in place under Bill C-14 to allow for an advanced request. And we would define that as something that would allow an individual under a specific set of circumstances 
um, to define the set of circumstances or the circumstance under which they wanted to receive their assisted, assisted death. We, uh, as Panice just noted, we expect that to be part of the parliamentary review that takes place, um, hopefully right after C7 has passed. Um, final consent or the waiver of final consent is again, as Panit referenced, part of Audrey's amendment. So this is one of the big wins that Bill C-7 gives us. Uh, it's the ability for an individual who's been assessed and approved and who has set a, a final date for their main procedure in consultation with their clinician to actually waive their final consent. Uh, and that means the clinician can then, in the event the individual loses capacity prior to their date, the clinician can move ahead with the procedure unless the individual expresses either verbally or physically that they don't want to proceed. And, and what that really does is it addresses situations like Audrey's Parkers, where an individual is forced to end their life earlier than they might choose to do because they're concerned that they'll lose the capacity to actually give that consent. So I think that's, that's the piece of Bill C-7 that is, um, you know, particularly wonderful for those people who have have had to choose to go early because they're so concerned um, with the, the risk of losing capacity to move ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Next question. Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen a lot of inquiries and reference to an advanced care plan. What are the key differences between an advanced care plan and an advanced request? Jim, do you want to take the lead? Yeah, I think Helen's given a good summary of uh, what an advanced request means and the importance of an advanced request uh, and the significance of Audrey, what we've called Audrey's amendment in, in, in C7. An advanced care plan is really a more general uh, arrangement that uh, each of us should have with uh, discussions we should have with our family or those closest to us so that they're aware of our wishes as we approach end of life and what we would want done or not done as the case may be. And this enables a substitute decision maker to uh, make decisions for us uh, in certain circumstances that we would outline in the advanced care plan um, if we were unable to make those, uh, those choices uh, ourselves because of, because of uh, a lack of capacity. And uh, folks who are interested in this topic could go to our website. We have a toolkit on our uh, www.dyingwithdignity.ca website. And that is being updated uh, as we speak, and the updated version would be available shortly. But it's important to uh, have those conversations so that uh, those who are closest to us are aware of our values and our wishes um, as we uh, approach uh, the end of life, so that those who might have to make decisions for us uh, are aware of what we would like done if we were able to uh, to, to, to make those wishes known at that time. Now, again, I want to reinforce the point that there's no capacity under current legislation uh, to provide for an advanced request for medical assistance in dying. And that is one of the topics that's being addressed in a, in a preliminary way by Audrey's amendment for people who've been assessed and approved, as Benit and uh, Helen had described. But then we would hope as part of the legislative review, which is required by C14 to broaden the discussion to advance requests uh, for medical assistance in dying in advance of having been assessed and approved for the procedure. Thanks, Jim. Okay, one question that we frequently get asked is whether a person with a dementia diagnosis can access MAID. Helen? Yeah, so yes, in some cases, an individual with mild or moderate dementia uh, may qualify if they meet the eligibility requirements and they have the capacity to make their own medical decisions. I think, again, you know, we're going to talk about Audrey's amendment for a second. These are individuals who in the past may have access their death early in order to avoid losing capacity before final consent. Uh, once the Bill C-7 is passed, they won't have to do that. So that's, uh, again, one of the, the good things about C-7 at this point. Thank you. Uh, Puneet, a question for you. So during C-7, I'm sorry, C-7 says that one of the two medical or nurse practitioners who assess a person would need to have expertise in that person's particular medical condition. How much of an issue do you think this will be for access to MAID? 
What type okay. of advocacy will Dine with Dignity Canada do to get clarity on what this means and its possible effects? That's a great question and something that we've uh, received before and, and I've heard before, but I want to remind folks of uh, uh, Minister Lametti on uh, the CBC Town Hall back in July. It was televised and um, we can always provide a link and in fact I think the link uh, had been provided but Minister Lametti clarified there that you know the expert assessment for made uh, it, it doesn't require a specialist but rather um, a practitioner with some level of expertise so um, you know he did make that clarification then and and we will be watching that that, that that's uh, honored. Okay fantastic. So we are going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, but before we do, uh, there was a question about the uh, reports that you mentioned, Jim. So just to clarify, everyone, that's called the Council of Canadian Academies. So if you just Google that, plus assisted dying, you should be able to access those reports quite easily. Um, but if you run into any issues, feel free to e email info at, at dyingwithdignity.ca and we can point you in the right direction. Okay, so I think the question on most people's minds right now is what will happen with Bill C-7, given the current situation with Parliament. Jim, can you tell us a bit more about what you could expect happening next with that situation? Well, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, Parliament prorogued on the 18th of August, and the effect of a prorogation is to kill uh, any legislation which is on the, order, on the order paper at the time. And you'll recall that C-7 uh, was introduced um, into the House of Commons by Minister Lametti and was at second reading. Several speeches had been given up about it, then prorogation came. And so C7 does no, long, no longer exist. And the minister has indicated that his intention is to reintroduce uh, C7, probably in the form in which it was, it was at prorogation. Um, we and others have suggested some changes that we'd like to see. We obviously don't know whether any of those suggestions will be accepted. I think we, can, we would expect that the bill will be reintroduced in essentially the same form as it was uh, before prorogation. And then it will be go to second reading, speeches will take place, it will then go to a committee, probably the Justice Committee of the House of Commons. It will be reviewed there in the committee and witnesses will be heard. And uh, we, as Dying, at Dying with Dignity, will certainly plan to appear and to uh, present our views on C7, which will be largely supportive. Not that there aren't other things that we'd like to see done, but that we think that C7, which was intended to be a response to the Truchon decision that Helen spoke about earlier, uh, it's, it's a good first step. And so we will be generally supportive of that. Uh, the committee will then report back to the House. There will be a re debate on the, on, on the report. It will proceed to third reading and would uh, hopefully pass the House of Commons and then would go to the Senate uh, where the same procedure would be followed. Second reading, committee, committee report, debate, um, and uh, third reading debate in the Senate. And then assuming it passes the Senate, uh, it would uh, then be submitted to the Governor General for royal assent and would become law. The government has not yet introduced this new bill, but has promised to do so and has promised to use its best efforts to have this bill passed into law before the December 18 deadline, which was imposed uh, by the Justice of the Quebec Superior Court. And that deadline, as I think has been mentioned, has been extended several times. So there will be an opportunity, both in the House and the House of Commons and the Senate, to suggest changes, improvements to the new bill, which will be brought in. But I think, you know, our, our expectation is and the basis upon which we're doing our, our planning is that that bill will be essentially the same as Bill C-7. Thank you, Jim. 
Um, a follow-up question to that. Will Dying with Dignity Canada be advocating for some of the more problematic aspects of C7 to be removed? For example, yes. the 90-day wait period. Yes, that, and, that's, and we've had discussions, uh, I should point out, that we're not only dealing with the government, we are a non-partisan organization, so we deal with parliamentarians in all parties and groups in both the House and the Senate. And we've had discussions with, uh, with other parliamentarians outside of government and uh, we brought our concerns to all of them and i think there is as Panit mentioned earlier some concern about 90 days uh, whether that's a reasonable period of reflection uh, or whether it ought to be some shorter period so we'll be bringing that uh, to our to the attention of of uh, parliamentarians but i think the the major concern is the specific include specific exclusion in C7 and presumably in the revised bill that will be presented shortly, uh, saying that mental illness um, is an exclusion. So if you're, if you're con the condition which is causing you the suffering which leads you to uh, seek medical assistance in dying is, is based on mental illness, then it's specifically excluded. And we think that's unfair. We think it's discriminatory. We think it's probably unconstitutional and would not survive a challenge. So we'll be pressing very much uh, to have that changed and that, that removed so that suffering, whether it's from physical illness or mental illness, will be uh, treated the same. Now, whether we'll be successful in getting that changed or even addressed in the course of the committee debates on the new bill uh, is we don't know at the moment, but it will certainly, as we've mentioned earlier, be the subject of uh, discussion and debate in the course of the legislative review. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to another polling question. I hope everyone enjoyed the first one and we're going to ask another question. So your participation again is, is appreciated. So this question is which of the three topics proposed um, that we talked about earlier, so advanced requests, mature minors, or requests for individuals whose condition is psychiatric in nature, which one is most important to you? So I'm going to launch the poll here. It's going to pop up again on your screen. And again, we'll give you 15, 20 seconds or so to choose your, um, your option there. And we also see a lot of questions coming through as well in the Q&A function. Thanks again for those. That's fantastic that you um, have so many questions for us. And we'll get to those at the end. As mentioned, if we don't get to your question, you can email us a follow-up email and we'll, we'll try to uh, get to as many answers as we can. It might just have to be uh, individual um, emails back and forth in some cases just because of the volume. Okay, so I am going to end the poll and share the results with everybody. So 83% of you um, chose advanced requests, 16% requests for um, those with a mental disorder as the sole underlying condition, and 1% requests for mature minors. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so I am going to uh, move right along here. Um, this question is for Helen. Helen, can you share a bit more about Dying with Dignity Canada's thoughts on mature minors, those with a sole underlying mental disorder, and those who would require an advance request? Sure. So I think, you know, those are obviously three key areas and ones that I think many people are interested in. Obviously, on this call, uh, we have a number of people most interested in advance requests, and we hear from Canadians in that situation every day. So what we're doing as we prepare for that parliamentary review, uh, we're looking at the experiences and the stories that we hear from individuals who contact us every day. Um, you can see a lot of those on our blog posts, but uh, that lived experience that we have access to. We're looking at the existing legislation. So what's in place now, as well as what's in C7, um, the pieces that may or may not be addressed when it comes back to the table, but any gaps in that existing uh, legislation that need to be filled. Uh, we're looking at the research, public opinion polls, uh, potentially doing some further research to uh, better inform our position and supplement the information we have. 
Um, over the past six months, we've had volunteers, including members of both our Disability Advisory Council and our First Persons Advocates Initiatives Council, who have shared their own experiences, and they've created recommendations um, in each of the three areas to help inform us as we, uh, as we put together our final position. We're also consulting, obviously, with our Clinicians Advisory Council and with uh, getting a legal perspective. And then finally, our internal advocacy committee, which is a committee of the board, will be taking the next six weeks to really finalize what do each of those pieces look like um, before we uh, begin to share that position more publicly. So those are kind of the next steps uh, along the way in the process for us. Thanks, Helen. Okay, uh, moving on uh, to a question for Puneet. Um, so in regards to those with a mental disorder, are there other countries in the world that allow this and what does this look like? Uh, yeah, great question, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so currently, um, assisted dying or uh, assisted suicide for, uh, for people with uh, a mental illness um, as the sole uh, underlying condition is legal in the uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, and euthanasia is uh, legal in Belgium and Switzerland. Uh, I should point out that there is some um, uh, eligibility criteria in each country that, it, you know, those criteria can include requirements, uh, including that the individual is facing unbearable suffering, that the individual is competent, that they are making a voluntary request, uh, and other factors. Um, the one thing I do want to just point out, I know that um, language is um, extremely important. So assisted suicide, uh, that's the patient administering uh, the medication themselves. Uh, and euthanasia is the clinician uh, administering the medication through, uh, through IV. Uh, and then, of course, here in Canada, we use uh, medically assisted dying. Uh, which is the patient with the support of the clinician or uh, the clinician administering the, uh, the medication. So just very uh, uh, want to make sure that people are aware of the distinction between the different um, the language being used. Great. Thank you. Okay. So it seems like we're still waiting to learn what the parliamentary review process will, will look like. In your experience in the Senate, Jim, uh, what could this process potentially look like? And when do you expect that it might start? Well, uh, under, you know, in, in a pre-COVID world, if we can remember what that was like, uh, the, the legislation which was passed, uh, C-14, specifically provided that after four years, uh, there would be a review of our experience with uh, the regime set up under C-14 and specifically it would deal with those three areas that were not dealt with in the original legislation, um, mature minors, advanced requests, and uh, mental illness. And then I mentioned the studies that were done uh, under pursuant to the order, order of Parliament. So the original plan was that that bill or that review would commence this summer, this summer past, uh, following the passage of C7, the response to Touchon. Well, obviously, uh, COVID uh, changed all of that. And um, as uh, we've explained, we're now waiting for the first, for the next version of C7. And the government's intention is to commence the legislative review following the passage of C7 so that the likelihood is that a legislative review will begin early in 2021. Now, what form that will take, again, we don't know. We've asked the government uh, about this. Uh, it could be uh, a standing committee, one of the existing committees, either the House or the Senate. It could be a special committee set up, established by Parliament in either House, or it could be a joint committee of the Senate and the House of Commons. And our recommendation I think our thinking at the moment in, in Dying with Dignity Canada is that it would be a good idea to uh, combine the expertise in both houses and have a joint committee of senators and members of parliament to look specifically at uh, our made regime in Canada 
and uh, what could or should be done to make it better with particular reference to those, uh, to those three areas that we've spoken about. Thanks, Jim, that's very helpful. Okay, so moving on, we have a couple questions for Puneet. Um, so Puneet, the next few months will be critical for advocacy efforts. Uh, what can supporters do in the remainder of 2020 to ensure that both, both Bill C-7 passes and that the parliamentary review is a priority? Yeah, that's a great question. A question I'm always happy to answer and um, uh, with the same answer, really, it's, uh, which is to have uh, supporters across the country engage with their members of parliament to let them know that, you know, the reintroduction of uh, of made legislation um, uh, needs to be a priority uh, now that Parliament has resumed and uh, uh, and you know plus our other messages and and when I talk about other messages I'm referring to uh, everything that we've spoken about about advanced requests mature minors and mental illness and I do want to uh, direct people uh, to uh, dyingwithdignity.ca under the get involved section where you can find uh, the Government Relations and Advocacy Toolkit from finding out who your MP is in case you uh, you don't know already uh, to requesting a virtual meeting um, to drafting the email for you to request that meeting it's all there for you and uh, uh, of course we're here to help uh, with any questions that you might have but uh, I know that the volunteers across the country uh, once you give them this type of information there's really no stopping them so um, I encourage you to continue that, um, and uh, but to know that I'm here to answer any questions as well. Fantastic, thanks. Um, and one more question for you, Puneet. If somebody did want to set up a meeting with their local MP, what's the best way to go about doing that? And uh, just wanting to encourage everybody that uh, virtual and, and uh, phone meetings are, are of course best um, at, this, at this time of uh, that we're in with the pandemic. So. Do you need any tips or advice? Yeah, I think um, reaching out to your MP, um, requesting the meeting is the is the first step, and and we provide that that sort of uh, information in the toolkit, and uh, it's really a matter of making that connection with your MP, and you know the MP's office is probably going to suggest that you meet by Zoom, uh, anyways. So. Um, uh, do mention it uh, to uh, to give them the understanding that that's what you feel comfortable with, uh, but it's probably uh, the standard procedure for most MPs and senators uh, to meet with constituents uh, is to do it virtually anyway. So, uh, but if we can help in any way, let us know. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so that is the end of our uh, questions that we have uh, arranged already, but we do have plenty of other questions to go through that you've been sending in um, throughout the session. So I am going to go over some of those and, and ask those um, for our presenters today. Um, so here's a question. So if, what does all of this mean for Quebec? And how does the Trishon decision and C7 and what's going on with, um, the delays we've experienced with C7, how, what's going on with, with Quebec and how are they impacted by what's been happening over the last several months? Who was that directed to? I couldn't... Oh, sorry, that was just a general one that came through. Okay. Um, Jim, did you want well, to take the lead? Sure, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I think the situation, as, as Helen described earlier, when she described the Truchon decision, the, the justice of the uh, of the Quebec Superior Court struck down provisions in the naturally foreseeable death eligibility criterion in C14 and the comparable uh, criterion in the Quebec legislation. And so that it's no longer necessary for someone in Quebec to have uh, uh, to, to meet that criterion. And the, 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 the court gave to the National Assembly in Quebec and to the Parliament of Canada a finite period of time to bring in legislation to fix the parts that have been overturned. And uh, the Government of Canada has had to seek two extensions to that and the current 
deadline is December the 18th. And after that point, if there's no legislation in place, then you will have two regimes. You'll have a requirement in Quebec, there'll be no longer be a requirement in Quebec that your national debt be reasonably foreseeable. But for those of us in the rest of Canada, there would have to be our natural death would have to be reason natural death would have to be reasonably foreseeable and that's obviously an undesirable situation to have where you'd have two different sets of criteria in place in the same country so the government intends and the government hopes to have c the c7 replacement passed by december 18 so that both in quebec and in the rest of Canada, that will no longer be a requirement to be eligible for medical assistance and die. In Quebec at the moment, as I understand it, what happens is that if you want medical assistance in dying and you don't have your natural death is not reasonably foreseeable, then you apply for an exemption uh, uh, from the court, which has been granted in a limited number of cases but that's not available in the rest of the country. Thank you, Jim. Um, this might be a follow-up question for, for you, Jim, or, or maybe for Helen and Sneed as well. Is there any chance that we might see another delay? We've seen a couple already. Um, is there any chance that might happen again with the December uh, due date for new legislation, or do we anticipate that it will certainly happen in, in uh, December? Well, our, our hope and expectation is, and the government's hope and expectation is that uh, they will have the new C7, shall we put it that way, uh, passed and uh, by both houses of parliament and given royal assent by December 18. Uh, I think they'd be hard pressed to go back to the court again and ask for another delay, but uh, uh, that's the situation they're up against that deadline and while there will be a lot of competition amongst departments for legislation in various fields uh, this is perhaps the only one where there's a court imposed deadline that would perhaps uh, move it up the queue uh, of legislation that has to has to uh, pass parliament question maybe Helen you can take the lead with this one but can you explain what we mean when we say mature minor yeah well I mean technically the term wouldn't be defined for us at this point in time I think when Puni put the chart up in terms of uh, legislation in other countries it has been defined for medically assisted death in countries from an age as young as uh, 12 and as high as an age of 18 so that would certainly be something that we would be looking to refine and come to a, you know, come to a number on as we move ahead and certainly looking at what the um, legislation or regulation in Canada says around other medical or health decisions that mature minors can make and, and what that definition is. Great. It's really um, a question of, it's really a question of capacity rather than chronological age. I mean, we, as I think Paneet mentioned earlier that uh, people who have not yet reached the age of majority make decisions about their own health care all the time. This is perhaps more serious, uh, but it's nonetheless a question of whether or not the person understands all of the implications and is capable and has the capacity to make uh, the decision. Thank you for that clarity. Is there anything that you feel is missing from C7? Anything that we wish to see in, in the bill that isn't there? Helen or, or uh, Jim? Well, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> ideally would we see advanced requests or would we see mental health included? Yeah, I, I think ideally, sure, there are, are other things and had, had there been more time, that might have been something to pursue, but I think as, you know, when the bill was originally released, the uh, parliamentary review was scheduled to start in June. So again, given the two major wins, Audrey's amendment and reasonable foreseeability being removed, um, you know, I think if we can get C7 through, perhaps with a couple of tweaks, that's a great scenario. And then really looking at uh, what else needs to happen in the parliamentary review. And again, going back to, of course, advance requests and uh, mental health obviously have to be the first two uh, considerations for us. 
Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize that C7 was not intended to be a, a comprehensive review of medical assistance in dying in Canada and fixing everything that needed to be fixed. It was a response to the decision of the Quebec court. And uh, there are several things in the bill which are good, which were not necessary in order to respond to, to the Toussaint decision. So those are good things. There's always, there are always things that we'd like to see, and uh, maybe some of them will uh, appear there, but they're more likely to be considered and result from the parliamentary review than from uh, the review of C7. Okay, thank you. Um, this question, maybe Puneet, you can take the lead with this one. So if somebody lives in an area and they know that their MP is not supportive of MAID, maybe they've you know, made some public statements in the past and they just don't think a conversation or, or meeting with their MP will go over very well. Are there other options that a person has to advocate for, for choice and, and for the law to, to get to the place where it needs to be? Uh, it's a great question. <clears throat> I would never uh, suggest to anyone to hesitate advancing uh, any of these positions to uh, any MP, um, really who holds any um, opinion that may be, you know, opposed to ours. Um, I think people should recognize that, uh, you know, trying to convince someone who's vehemently opposed to it may not be the best use of time and to, to find other ways, which could include you know, participating in uh, letter writing campaigns uh, um, designed by Dying with Dignity Canada, um, doing other advocacy work at the community level, um, volunteering as a, you know, uh, someone who goes out and, and provides advanced care presentations. Those are all ways that our message can be delivered. Um, and, and, you know, considering in this situation that's been suggested that perhaps the MP may not be as friendly to our message. Uh, there's many ways to advance our position, for sure. Can I just add another thought there, Kelsey? Mm -hmm. And that is that I think that I, I was there at the time when this, uh, when this discussion took place, and there were a lot of unknowns. We had no experience in Canada with medical assistance in dying, and there were stories that came from other parts of the world which may or may not have been true and the experience may or may not have been accurate but we now have three or four years of experience in Canada and I think that the experience that Canadians have had with our medical assistance in dying regime has been almost uniformly positive and I think that a lot of the fears that people legitimately have uh, about what would happen, would, was this the, a slippery slope where there are going to be horrible things happening to Canadians and by, to Canadians by other Canadians, and none of that has happened. And so we have a very good medical assistance in dying regime in place in this country. Can it be improved? Yes, like anything else it can. And that's what we're trying to do. But I think that many people who might have been opposed to this because of what they had heard three or four or five years ago, might have a different view today based upon actual made in Canada experience. So I think that even a member of parliament or a senator who was opposed to medical assistance in dying at the time, views might have modified and, and certainly they should be prepared to listen to Canadians who have real experience with medical assistance in dying and those stories that actual personal experiences are very impactful on parliament, parliamentarians. So I would urge people to not to shy away from letting people know what you think about these things. Thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, this is a question about dementia. Uh, Helen, maybe you can take the lead with this one. With the new law scheduled to come into effect and the piece of that law that's saying that it, it wouldn't address um, those with a, a mental uh, illness or psychiatric illness as the, the root of their um, condition. Uh, what does that mean for dementia? And would dementia be qualified as a, a physical or a mental illness? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's totally clear, Kelsey. Uh, we've certainly talked about it at our Clinician's Advisory Council, and I think there's some mixed opinions as to um, where exactly dementia would fall. So I do think there's an element of we'll need to see what happens there. I think, you know, we spoke earlier about the fact that some individuals with mild and moderate dementia who otherwise meet the criteria can still be eligible. I think that will probably continue. Um, but that's one that I, I think there is a little bit of um, we need to see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Now, just to clarify further the difference between an advanced care plan and an advanced request, could you share some examples of what somebody might put in their advanced care plan and again, how that differs from an advanced request? So uh, maybe I'll just reiterate that advanced requests are not legal. There's no option to have an advanced request right now, but it would be in theory, someone defining a set of circumstances in which they would want to reach made at some point, access made at some point in their life. So as a potential example, um, an individual who, when they lose the ability to take care of themselves, have self-care, um, they don't recognize their loved ones, they don't appear to be enjoying uh, their quality of life. Uh, if they had the availability of an advanced request, they might put that in there and that might be how they determined um, when it was time to access made. Um, with advanced care planning, think of it more as um, almost defining your values and your belief system and your um, how you feel about your end of life. So having that conversation, which you can then document so that in the event you have a substitute decision maker, someone who's making those decisions because you're not able to make them, they know that you value, for example, being able to visit your grandkids. You value um, spending time doing your hobby by yourself. You value being able to get up every day and get out of bed. And so likewise, they understand what you would not want your life to look like. So it's really that sharing. And if you go through the kit that we have on our website, uh, it helps you to document those kinds of things. What, what's important to you? What do you want to see at end of life? How do you feel about that? Um, so that's really what that process does. Great. Um, can you also, Helen, this is just a, a general question about made, but can you define what an assessor is and if there's a certain qualification that a person needs to have to be an assessor? Kelsey, you're probably better, <laughs> better, better positioned to answer that. But basically, uh, part of the requirement is you have to be assessed and approved by two clinicians. And in Canada, depending on the province, that can be either a doctor or a nurse practitioner. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, that, that's fine. That, that's perfect. I think um, an additional no question we often get, and I'm not sure if the person asking wanted to know this part as well, but there's no medical specialty involved. So, you know, plenty of assessors are family physicians, some are palliative care providers, um, some are anesthesiologists, but there's no, um, there's a wide range of different uh, types of doctors that you see uh, taking on the role as a maid assessor uh, and or provider. Okay, we're reaching the end. We'll maybe have time for one or two more questions, depending on, uh, on the length of those, those questions. Um, or the answers. That's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so looping back to the witness changes or potential changes that would be coming under C7. So it, as mentioned in the, the slideshow earlier on, somebody can be a paid uh, personal or healthcare worker. Could you provide some additional information on, on who those people might, might be and what that might mean for access? Maybe Helen or? I feel like I'm hogging the questions. Um, yeah, so that could be, and I think, you know, there's been some exceptions made in this area during uh, the pandemic as well, but it could be, for example, someone who cares for you in the hospital. Um, or PSW who maybe is visiting you regularly, uh, we would expect that there will still be some restrictions as there are now around, um, you know, not being an individual who otherwise benefits from your death, but it could be, a, you know, a healthcare worker who's either in the facility where you reside, the hospital, um, visiting you in your home, any of those scenarios are possible. Great, okay, that's helpful. 
Okay, so we are almost at the end of our session. Um, what we want to do just as a, a wrap up is ask the same question that we asked at the beginning. So um, the same polling question is there. How knowledgeable do you feel you are about the proposed changes? And I'm just going to pop that up on your screen again. So if you could answer that question again for us, that would be very helpful. Um, so it is up on the screen there. And while you're working away at answering that polling question, um, I just wanted to go over what will happen next. So this was recorded. What we're going to do is post it to the Dying with Dignity Canada website um, probably early next week. So take a, a look back Tuesday, Wednesday of next week and it should be on our page. If you have any trouble finding it, you can email us and we'll send you the direct link. We're also going to, as mentioned, send out a survey. Once we shut down the webinar for today, it should pop up on your screen and it will also be sent uh, through email to all of our attendees uh, 24 hours from now. So you'll, you'll have two opportunities to answer our, our questions. And the information that we get is so valuable and helpful for us as we figure out our webinar plan for 2021 and beyond. So we appreciate you taking you know, five minutes or so to fill in that, that survey for us. Um, I'm going to shut down the poll so we can see those results. I'm just going to share them with everybody. So 51% feel somewhat knowledgeable, 40% very knowledgeable. That's great. That's a, a big change from uh, an hour ago. 8% uh, a little bit knowledgeable and 1% not knowledgeable at all. So if you did want to learn more, we will continue to post on our website. Um, as we learn more about what everything will look like in the coming months, we will also be updating our supporters through email. So um, lots more to come on this very important issue. So with that said, I think we, we have everything covered. And I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us this afternoon. It's been so helpful uh, to hear from you and to get a better sense of what's happening and what to expect in the coming months. And to all of our supporters who joined this afternoon, um, we appreciate you taking an hour out of your day to spend with us and look forward to seeing you at future webinars to come. Have a fantastic day.